I'm Rob Koifman, founder of Koifman. And I'm panicked about being a new dad. Yeah, yeah, 2022. Yeah. Canute, I'm broke. You are. Yeah. What happened? The markets are happening. Right. So you're not feeling well again. Is this a, a contract ploy or are you not feeling well? <laughs> my cold that I had a few weeks ago has come back. So now my voice is starting to, I'm starting to lose my voice. Well, Canute is not feeling well. So it's a one man show. And you had a surgery. We're not going to talk about it, but you had a surgery and you're yeah, okay. That was about a, a week ago and it's, it's going all right. Uh-huh. Yeah, that mole. I hated that mole. Yeah, and it was, it was it was hard to see my nose. Speaking of moles, we have someone from Eastern Europe on the show today. <laughs> see what I work these? I, there's nothing better than a transition, especially when I don't even know if it makes sense. <laughs> so I think the year 2022 is going to come down to fundamentals. So today I want to talk about fundamentals. I think this year will be defined by fundamentals. We have been living in an era, Canute, Knut, whatever we call it, Dr. K, of imagination. Um, anything goes to the point where we have made up money on the blockchain and we have flying, well, we're almost about flying cars, but we have all kinds of tech and it's been great. It's been a party, but things seem to have changed late last year as the Fed has decided to rein in a little bit of the 50-year party of loose money. And all of a sudden, here we are in uh, January, but uh, people are nervous. And we're not seeing it in you know the fangs, or we're not seeing it in the indexes yet. We're not seeing it in oil. Oil's in a party. But uh, stocks that were trading at 100 times revenue are now at 50 times revenue, and stocks that were at uh, 40 times revenue are at 20 times revenue, which is not cheap. But we have hit a point where someone's saying, let us look at the numbers. And with that in mind, I want to invite Rob Koifman, who uh, will dial in. Rob is the founder of Koifman. And I think other than StockTwits and Robinhood is the product I use the most in our portfolio. So this was an investment of social leverage. Uh, we were seed investors two, three years ago when Rob was... Uh, you know, about a year in or a year and a half into his project, leaving Goldman Sachs to build what I think is the most beautiful retail, prosumer, individual, even institutional market fundamental uh, desktop product for evaluating stocks, markets, ETFs, etc. Now, Rob will do a much better job of be explaining it. I just use the product and call Rob and go, how do you do this? How do you do that? That's the joy of of being Howard. Um, but I want to talk about fundamentals, what's happening in the market, how he thinks about building a product for a world that hasn't cared about fundamentals, but obviously, uh, and data, all these things that go into creating a really a magnificent product. And he's also a startup. He's raised about $6 million. And, uh, so he can talk about the joy and the, uh, pain of a startup and it and he sounds to be panicked about being a dad and i'm like fuck that uh there's a spock book for that <laughs> and we're not even going to cover that is that okay with you canute absolutely all right so let's get uh, don't we're not do not let him talk about his kid all i've right, seen the enough. kid i've held the kid on my lap that's about i've done my job as a vc so let's get rob on the phone <phone rings> rob you're on hey hey canute hey howard Hey. hey, buddy. Uh, you know, being panicked about a kid, pfft, no problem. You know, you got a startup. That's your your child. That's the child that I care about. <laughs> it's not, uh, but uh, your kid, I would say, Mur Maury, Murray. What's this kid's name? My kid's name is Archie. Oh, I was Just... close. Uh, <laughs> I've held Archie, spittled on me once over a stake in Miami, but uh, the name, I forgot the name. He is a cute kid, this Archie, a lot of, lot of giant head. That's what I remember. Is that true? Still big head. Yeah. Big head, oh, full of data, because you're a data guy. So, so, Rob, are you from Eastern Europe? 
I was born in Ukraine. Is that Eastern Europe? Uh, definitely Eastern Europe, yep. And at what point do you think this year it'll be Russia? Ah, oh, man, I don't think it'll be Russia. I don't, uh, yeah, I, th I think it's going to continue to be Ukraine. I think there's uh, a lot of internal determination to remain Ukraine. Well, I, and are you, are you for it remaining independent? Uh, I, I'm definitely for Ukraine remaining Ukraine, as uh, I believe most Ukrainians are. So that's as deep as politicals will ever go on this show. I am for whatever Rob is for, and it makes sense to me. And I'm not a Russia fan, so I, I stress about this stuff, because anytime I hear Ukraine, I go, oh, poor Rob, he's got family, you know, all these people with family. And we, we, we think we have problems because growth stocks are being cut in half. But uh, around the world, it's still like age-old problems. Of people taking over other people. So, Rob, when did you move here again? Moved here in 1987. And you went to school? <laughs> I, did, I did go to school. <laughs> you read? I, <laughs> Hang on, I just want to make sense. Do you read? Yeah. See, are you fun with phonics? No, so 87 you moved here, but for grad school or for undergrad? <laughs> yeah, I was in, uh, let's see, 1987 I was in second grade. Oh, my God, second grade. But you were from Eastern Europe, so second grade means you could already code right. and MIT, you played right. with rocket ships because that's, that's what people right. did. So we're going to skip over from grade two to today. Uh, the reason you're here today is to talk about Coifin and fundamentals. We have seen this shift, right? It's been a party in the markets. Uh, give me a ticker. Uh, give me a Discord room or Reddit or stock tweets and Twitter. Stocks only go up. The when did you see a turn in this market? Not your bit. When did you see a turn where because you see people clicking and, and spending time? Do fundamentals matter? And obviously they do. But like, do you see them mattering in the last three months more than ever? Yeah, fundamentals definitely matter. I'd say uh, the longer the time horizon, the more important the fundamentals. Um, I'd say over a shorter time horizon, there's a lot of speculation on what the future fundamentals will be. But ultimately, the fundamentals have to support and have to be proved out, uh, whether bullish or bearish, for, for a story to make sense. So I think uh, kind of peak SPAC mania about February, March of last year, was the was the kind of turn was when the market started digesting a lot of these stories a lot of these hypes and really starting to think through whether those stories are actually going to come to fruition and how to value those stories um, and i'd say over the past year we've been sort of trying to digest that and now we're at a point where it's obviously moved completely the other way uh probably a lot of a lot of uh, stocks that don't depend on hype that actually have the fundamentals coming through have been thrown out with the bathwater, but um, that's, that's I'd say, what's happened over the past year, that shift. When did you get the bug, the stock market bug? <laughs> when did I get the stock market? <laughs> How did you know about that bug? <laughs> um, we all got uh, it. You have it. You've turned it into an entrepreneurial spirit. But when did you know that stocks were your life? I, I got into investing in the 90s when I bought CMGI. Oh, um, and talk about was, a story. That was a story, yeah. And uh, it, there was just something really exciting about learning uh, about companies, about stocks, about uh, you know having that adrenaline rush of of making money or losing money. Um, you know, ultimately going through my journey on on Wall Street in terms of understanding how different investors value stocks and how different invests uh, from a macro perspective or a vol perspective. Um, and that was just really eye opening. Um, in terms of learning all those all those new uh, ways of investing, so it's something I'm I'm really interested in my entire career. Um, I've always been interested in analyzing the data and really coming to the right answer based on the data, by, based on the analysis, and it's something that I was super passionate about on Wall Street, and that's something that I brought to Coifin in terms of making these analytics and these tools available for more investors. So, so my audience is all potential Coifin users uh, tell that's the best description of what Coifin is and the vision. Yeah, so Coifin is a financial data analytics platform. Basically, what we help you do is research stocks, understand market trends, and why we're different and the value we bring is that we provide much more advanced analytics than you would normally get if you're an individual investor. Um, and if you're a professional investor and you're using a Bloomberg, then 
we have some overlap and functionality there, but I'd say we're much more modern, much more intuitive, much easier to use than the Bloomberg. So if you think about the, um, the landscape for analytical tools, on one end, you have Bloomberg. On the other hand, you have uh, uh, Yahoo Finance, and they're at extremes. We sit in the middle, and we provide a uh, more advanced data set for you to analyze data, both on stocks, ETFs, mutual funds, um, and then giving you all the graphing tools, all the dashboarding tools to really dig into the data and really understand uh, what's going on there. Yeah, for people who haven't tried it, koyfin.com. Uh, you don't need to know much. You need to go just type it in, sign up, and your dashboard, when you open it up, is pretty much more than you'll ever need or that you'll get for free anywhere organized on the web. Is that what you were thinking when you first started it? Yeah, I, I, you know, I'd say... Um, it feels like I have a Bloomberg. It feels like I'm an astronaut. It feels like I'm a professional. It has all that look and feel that says, if you can't learn, like this is your start page. It's like the old homepage. Is that what you were thinking when you did it? Uh, when we were creating Coifin, I definitely created something that I find useful and that I find useful for myself. Um, and that's part of the reason why we have uh, a lot of stock data, a lot of equity data, but also a lot of macro data. So I started on Wall Street uh, covering single stocks, but then I transitioned and covered a lot more macro themes um, and, and top-down themes and, and some of my other jobs. And that's why we have we have both, um, or part of the reason we have both. But today, you know, investors just want to know about everything. They just don't want to know about stocks, or they don't want to just know about ETFs. Um, and it's this concept of uh, all the data in one place. You don't want to context switch if you um, you know if you hear that uh, bond yields are blowing out, and you have to go and find another website to graph those bond yields or to see how they've performed over time, just to have a context of how those bond yields looked or how they correlate with some of your stocks. Um, so our our goal and what we want to do is have all the financial data in one place, so you don't have to context switch. And you don't have to go to another uh, analytics provider to find that data. And so the hardest part at the beginning was, and this is kind of the stuff that held back our industry, is how expensive it is to even buy that data to reorganize it in the way you've done. So was that the hardest part still today? I, I'd say that's definitely one of the hardest uh, parts of what we're doing is organizing financial data and making it just available very quickly. Um, and we've built a pretty robust infrastructure to ingest different data types. So I'd say in finance, there are a couple of challenges. Number one, the fact that a lot of data providers are still sending us XML files and still kind of selling us, sending us these, these legacy ways of transferring data. Uh, not everyone has this robust API connection that we could just plug into. And that's just the reality of financial data. A lot of these data providers are still running legacy ways of delivering data. And so we have to find a way to uh, to ingest that in a in a robust and scalable way. And then the second thing is we have to connect all these different data sets. So if we are, for example, we're getting Reuters news from Reuters and we're getting our fundamental data from Cap IQ, we have to connect those data points on the back end um, and make sure that we have a consistent database. And that's not, not that simple. Um, it's not that simple because different data providers have different symbologies it's also not that simple because there's um, a lot of tickers and, and the way that uh, you think about tickers. So Apple, we all know Apple trades in the U.S., but there's uh, about a dozen other Apple tickers in the world, including one in Argentina, including one in Ukraine, um, and, and then figuring out a way to uh, organize that data and making sure that if a new story about Apple is coming from Reuters, how do we link that to the other tickers in our database and how do we make sure that that database stays um, uh, clean and up to speed. Yeah, I, I'm always on you about more, 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 but I, I never really understand the back end of it. No one gets, you're, you're cleaning up such a mess that the legacy people don't have to clean up or refuse to clean up or maybe never will clean up. Or like what, what would make, is CapIQ or Reuters or anything, these companies disruptable or can they improve to the point that they can, you think it'd be in their interest to work with companies like Coifin. So what, what have you found out around that sector? Yeah. So, you know, I'd say that a lot of these companies, they have um, a really strong core business of what they're offering. And that core business is something that they've offered for a long time. And I'd say uh, 
innovating and changing the way that you do things just takes a long time if 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 you're a um, if you're a large company um, and that goes in finance um, if if you're one of these legacy providers or if you're Oracle or if you're IBM um, it's not that easy to just shift uh, your strategy and, and to shift the way that you've been doing things so um, I'd say with us what we focused on is not on the data or in terms of um, the value we bring is not in terms of proprietary data so we're not going out there and scraping the filings and getting the data ourselves. There are other companies that do that very well. What we are really good at and the value we bring is the analytics layer that then ingests the data from a bunch of different places and makes it easily available to our users. Um, So one of the key benefits and one of the key things that we're doing is, is hooking up to different data providers. Right now we have about a dozen data providers that we hook up to. Um, In the future, it's going to be multiples of that. But the ultimate vision is we're going to have any single financial data point on Coifin, uh, whether it's stock data or crypto data or options data or futures data, and our users will be able to customize the platform and to really take what they need and analyze a subset of the data of what they're looking for. So uh, um, there are very few investors that want all financial data, but what we want to do is allow each user to then customize the system and pick the data that they need to really do their job and to invest in what they want to invest in. And so what's the market that appeals to you the most as a Coifin creator, uh, founder? Like, who's the segment? Yeah, so what's interesting about our platform is because um, we've bridged these two worlds, um, the, the, the dichotomy I talked about before, Bloomberg being on one side, Yahoo Finance being on the other side. Um, and in a nutshell, we are built for professionals, but available to individuals. And so we have an advanced product that's available to individuals. And because of that, we have a lot of different types of users on our platform. Uh, we have hedge fund managers that are managing billions of dollars using Coifin. And we have students who are just starting their finance journey using Coifin. And that kind of presents a really interesting opportunity and a pretty interesting challenge. So we can't be everything to everyone today, um, and we're focused on two groups today. Uh, one are fundamental investors, so investors that are looking at stocks from a fundamental perspective. That means they're interested in valuation, interested in, in financials, they're interested in filings and transcripts. And they're um, interested and in the context and groupings, how one stock relates to another stock. How one stock relates to another stock vis-a-vis the, the, the fundamentals or uh, the valuation or something thematic. So, yeah. you, you know, you mentioned before, Howard, kind of going into any Discord channel or any room and just buying any stock that's punted there. Um, and that's sort of the opposite of what we're doing. So we're not meant for all investors. And actually, most investors probably wouldn't find Coifin interesting or useful because that's not how they think. They don't want to go in and analyze a company from a fundamental or financial or thematic perspective. They just want to kind of just um, read about something and be like, oh, I should buy this. Great, I'm going to buy it. Uh, we're really for those investors that that want to go in and analyze the company, the stock, the industry on their own, and really understand those trends that are that are underlying uh, that investment. Um, interestingly, one of the the biggest customer segments that we have are engineers, are hmm. uh, and engineers because they are uh, quantitative, so they love numbers. Uh, they're typically pretty smart, and they have a large disposable income nowadays. Um, so that's we found that to be kind of one of the largest individual segments on our platform. But um, we have kind of people from from all walks of life, including um, a lot of uh, international users. So about uh, 40 40 percent of our users are outside the U.S. Um, outside of Canada. Brazil is a big market for us. Uh, China, India. Um, so yeah, very very varied. So in between Bloomberg and Yahoo Finance, I like that. And and Bloomberg people pay up to five grand a month for Bloomberg. Mm-hmm. And Yahoo is free, but you pay, you are the product, so you have ads, and definitely Yahoo's historically done a great job around displaying things. Um, but obviously, you've innovated on that, and then obviously you've taken data to the next level, whereas Yahoo doesn't have the search capabilities that you have. Yeah, I, I'd say, look, I, I'd say Yahoo um, occupies a really interesting role and a very important role in that it provides a lot of useful information to a lot of people, particularly people that just want a stock price or just want something simple. Um, But if you want to kind of go to the next level of analytics in terms of graphing 
uh, financials or fundamentals, historically understand what's driving margins, looking at transcripts, um, looking at filings, understanding what ETF components, uh, how ETF composition is driving stock prices. Um, Yahoo Finance isn't going to give you that. Um, so Yahoo Finance will give you kind of the basics, which is great. Um, it's everything that a lot of investors would want. Um, but if you wanted to get into kind of more uh, specific data points, uh, if you wanted to really have more advanced capability of, of graphing or creating dashboards or looking at, at valuations, fundamentals, Yahoo Finance is not a, not a great tool for that. Um, you would maybe take some of that data and output it into Excel and try and do it there. Um, and Coifin, what we're trying to do is we're building the analytics for you to do that right in the platform so you don't have to put that into Excel. And I, I would argue with this on this. Every person that buys a stock, whether it was from a friend in Discord, should still have a desk. We've never lived in a better era for desktop. So this is one of my thesis in, in coming to you and finally investing a few years ago is that the world had been squeezed into a Robin Hood screen and a Reddit channel and a stock Twitch mobile app and a Twitter mobile app. We had figured out how to get the world into one screen. The beautiful thing about investing is then unbundling that one more time, meaning, okay, now that I have everything, how do I look at it differently? So, so I think there is an elegance and an importance for people, even if they just want to invest for fun, to just look at the stock they own in relation to its peers. You know, there's always a way to begin fundamental analysis. So I, I do think it's for everybody in the sense that whether you're just doing this for fun or not, there is tools out there like Coifin that allow you to build a list, see things in relations to other things, and, you know, learn by doing. And in that world, you've now finally come up with a tier, not finally, but you decided it was time or uh, to test, hypothesize, build premium products. How, do, how does that work today for Coifin? In, in terms of how we decide what product to yeah, build? Yeah, and what are they? Like, how do you tier it? Yeah, so um, a lot of it is speaking to our users and just understanding what our users want. Um, and then I'd say we look at it across different dimensions. So first thing is is we bucket it into those different workflows that, that I mentioned before, which is fundamental investors or macro investors or novice investors who uh, maybe are requesting functionality that has to do with more tutorials. Um, and, and our focus over the next six to 12 months is, is really kind of those, those fundamental investors. That's a big focus of ours. Um, another focus of ours is really connecting more and more data into our platform to be that one-stop shop for data. So uh, uh, crypto is very important on our roadmap as well for 2022. Um, and then we have a, a framework of, of how we think about the, the benefit to our users. So um, there's sort of three different buckets uh, when we think about benefit. Number one is something that's table stakes, something that um, maybe some of our competitors have and, and we're just trying to get some feature parity uh, versus our, our competitors. Um, so an example uh, of that would be like a screening tool. A screening tool is, is something that other platforms have. We haven't built it yet. Uh, we've prioritized other things before that. And so we have to build a screening tool that's going to be, uh, that's going to make us comparable with, with some of the other platforms out there. Uh, the second thing that we, the second bucket that we think about is something that our competitors uh, don't have that's uh, a little bit more interesting. Um, so one of the things that we'll be working on as an example in that bucket is different ways of scoring stocks. Um, so being able to score uh, stocks on, on different fundamentals and valuations and providing quantitative scores uh, to be able to really uh, look at a snapshot of a stock and then saying, hey, on these measures, it's, it's overvalued or the growth rate looks uh, above average or below average and on profitability or insider holdings or short interest or whatever the ratio is, we're going to be scoring that for you. So you get a, an immediate conclusion of, of how that stock scores versus its own history versus the market versus the sector. Um, and that's something that's not available in a lot of platforms. So I'd say that's pretty differentiated. That's bucket number two. Um, and then bucket number three is something that's a little bit more experimental and we're not sure where it's going to go, but we understand that it's pretty important. Um, and that an example of that would be uh, more social features on Coifin. So mm -hmm. ways to discuss stocks, uh, ways to, uh, you know, maybe have like Wikipedia pages that our users edit uh, when they're editing like a bull case or a bear case uh, where they're sharing their notes about a stock, something like that. So 
we we know the general purpose or the general workflow is important and it will be important for for our users but we're not exactly sure how that's going to look and it's going to require some iteration so i'd say those three buckets are the way that we uh, look at projects and features from a risk reward perspective and then we sort of map it onto what type of user would be using that feature And is your user a desktop user or is there, I mean, there, you have a, a mobile web and it's great, but is your user the one that pays? The one that pays, what's the highest price point? 99 bucks a month? So we have three tiers or we have four tiers. One is free, one is $15 a month, and one is $35 a month, and one is $70 a month. And what do people lean towards right now, your user base? Uh, the Most users are on the middle tier, the plus tier, the $35 a month tier. And so it's very inexpensive. So in a world where it's very inexpensive and you're getting great uptake, right? People aren't complaining. Like right now you're growing very fast in terms of people switching to premium product, correct? Yeah, we've been growing uh, about 15% a month for the past three months. And so that's converting people to a premium product. In a world where people pay thousands of dollars a month for Bloomberg, is there is there something that people want? For me, it's like, can I talk to Rob? Cause I'm lazy. Is, is, is in, in a perfect world where you have endless capital, is an 800 number the fastest way to grow because everything's already in the day. You have 90% of the data in there and it's pretty well organized. People just don't know how to get it. So in a perfect world, we have endless capital. Would it, you know, I would say, do you just put an 800 number on the website and say, Hey, we'll set you up. Would that be the easiest thing or would that just be a nightmare? Um, I, I don't think it'll be a nightmare. I um, I think that would be very useful. Um, I think there's a there's a segment of the population there that wants kind of that that phone support, uh, that wants the the hand holding, that white glove service, and there's an argument to be made that we should do that and we would do that. So it's it's sort of like the superhuman onboarding where they have the half hour onboarding call with each one of their users to show them all the shortcuts. Mm -hmm. um, I'd say that would be very beneficial for, for our users where there's just a ton of functionality. And I do uh, user interviews. I'll do it with users who are on Wall Street and have a Bloomberg. And they don't know a lot of the functionality on Coifin just because there's just so much there. You know, it's like Excel. Even if you know Excel, there's Correct. always something in Excel that you don't know. Like, right. I, I don't care who you are. Uh, whether it's how to create a macro or a pivot table or a VLOOKUP or an HLOOKUP or uh, whatever it is, there's just always something in Excel where uh, it's it's hidden way deep under there um, and you'd benefit from from someone showing it to you. So, you know, that's, that's definitely a key challenge uh, for us to tackle over the next year is how do we expose that functionality? How do we get users to really um, understand and, and really know what functionality is there? And we're working uh, more on, on help pages. We're going to be doing more webinars and, and more YouTube videos, um, having discussions and, and really featuring the product and showcasing the functionality. Um, and I think that idea, Howard, that you just brought up of, of having that white glove service, which you have by investing in Coifin, but having that for, for some of our other customers, um, I, think, I think that's a good one. I think it's a testament to how hard, how hard real fintech data problems are because you're tackling data meets visualization meets where do you start means everybody has a different view. So it's easy for me to nitpick when I chat with you because I have my own unique look at the world and I want the product to work just for me. So, so that's why I appreciate Coifin in general. It's all there. It's just user generally that doesn't know how to do it. So in a perfect world where you have two years endless capital, which you don't, uh, but two years endless capital, no one calling you, you know, and you just had two years to build exactly what Rob thinks has to be built. You mentioned the things that you're working on, but in a world where you just had two years, you know, no one could bug you. You don't care where the market's going. Here's what I want to build. What would be the three things? Yeah, so I'd say um, in the first bucket, there'd be kind of features that we just want to build that we haven't built yet because of resources. Um, and so having more resources would help us build those features faster. So an example would be a screening tool, alerts, getting more data into the platform. Yep. Um, that's kind of like a, a pretty straightforward use of capital. Um, I'd say the second thing that, that we want to do um, that's interesting is really move into the execution um, so allowing our users to then trade on Coifin, um, and that's a key pillar of where we see Coifin in the future is allowing that execution. 
Mm-hmm. Um, and then the last thing is really starting um, and growing our content strategy. So today we have a lot of users that are using Coifin in their blogs, on their sub stacks, on um, stock twits, on Twitter, and they're posting graphs and charts. Um, and I, uh, what I think would be really interesting is if Coifin had a research product or a content product where we're sending out daily and weekly emails that are discussing different market themes, different market trends that are going on, using the tools to then analyze those and really informing our users, educating our users, but then also showing off some of the analytical capabilities that, that Goyfin can do. And I'd, I'd say that would be sort of the last thing, uh, the third thing that, that we want to build out. So those are all kind of uh, immediate or high high priority uses of capital that, that we want to uh, implement. So I don't have enough capital to make that happen, nor the patience to leave you alone, as you know. So uh, for VCs that are smart and listening in, if you were were left to do that for the next two years, what's the TAM? What is Rob's TAM for this product five years out if you get to build, you know, interconnectivity, some social features, trading, and research? What is the TAM of a product like this? Yeah, I'd say I'd say the TAM. You could think about it as the the existing TAM, um, the total addressable market. Yeah, is the existing TAM that we see from um, kind of let's call it from professional services and from some of the current brokers that are capturing some of the trading volume and some of those analytical tools. Mm-hmm. Um, and that TAM is about fifty fifty billion dollars. If you were to uh, directly look at those users that I just mentioned, I'd say for us, kind of the interesting um, trend to think about is the is the future TAM in terms of where the future is going, mm-hmm. and where the future is going is there's just going to be a magnitude more of individual investors that need tools like this because where the world is going is that you have individuals that don't want to consider themselves as novices; they want those professional tools, they want to have that data and the analytics. And it's the do-it-yourself mentality that you want to make the decisions on your own and not outsource that to somebody else. And there's a definitely a subset or a portion of of investors that want to outsource that to a financial advisor. Uh, But where the world is going, um, more and more individuals want to do that themselves, and they need the tools to do that themselves. So I'd say to believe in Coifin, you have to believe that in five, ten years, there's going to be more individual investors that are going to be doing the investing themselves and that are going to be um, that want to get to the answers themselves. You have to believe that it's going to it's going to be global. It's not just going to be kind of the U.S. is the biggest investor base that there are going to be um, more international and more investors outside the U.S. that care about the stuff. And that's exactly where the world has been heading over the past several years in terms of regulation and who's allowed to own what. Um, and the last thing is you have to believe that all the asset classes are sort of going to converge. So you're not going to have just crypto or just equities or just options. Um, You're going to have investors that want access to every single market. And that if you're an investor, you want access to crypto and to options and to futures and to FX. And it's just not just going to be siloed to one market. So those are sort of the, the, the trends that we're playing and that we're riding. Um, And if you believe in those trends, then Coifin is the place to be. And so you've raised, what, six-ish million from Kraft and myself and some users? That's right. We've raised uh, about six nine million million with a, a seed and pre-seed um, and a safe. And let's now talk about what you, you're passionate about the markets you invest. The markets themselves, the bond market, in a world where bonds are such a gigantic market, and the institutional bond market so big, where does that fit into Coifin? Do people even look up this stuff? And like, what should people know about the bond market that are beginners? Yeah, so uh, the bond market is very important. Uh, the bond market sort of dictates what the base level returns uh, are, what discount rates are in the in the marketplace. Um, and th- there's not kind of like a, a black and white answer to, are bond yields higher, good or bad for stocks? Um, d- depends how the market is interpreting and depends on, on where we are in the cycle. But following bond yields, understanding where they are, understanding what drives them is super important to uh, what what's happening in stocks, as we've seen over the past uh, six months or over the past year. My, my view, the way I look at things is I actually think that bond yields are going to be capped over the next year. 
And the reason that bond yields are going to be capped is because historically when there's liquidity that's leaving the system, when liquidity is being reduced because the Fed is hiking rates or the Fed is tapering and the Fed is withdrawing liquidity from the market, that tends to slow down growth or that tends to slow down the market's view of growth. And that's what bond yields are. They're sort of the forward-looking nominal growth view of, of investors. And so I think because we are having this reduction in liquidity and where the Fed is going to raise rates, they're going to taper, that is going to put a cap on bond yields. And that's what's happened historically. So historically, when the Fed uh, started to raise rates or when the Fed started to taper uh, and reduce some of their bond holdings, bond yields tended to uh, sort of stay flat or decline in that environment. I know right now that's not the case. So if you've uh, been looking at bond yields over the past several weeks, uh, bond yields have been going up, but based on history and, and based on kind of how liquidity feeds into the bond market's view of nominal growth, um, I, I reached the conclusion that bond yields are, are capped for, for the rest of the year. Interesting. So you're saying the reaction is already, unless you're wrong, the reaction is getting priced in very quickly. Growth stocks are being hammered, but people are now probably overreacting to rate rises. You know, I think we've had a, uh, uh, can I use the word unprecedented? I'm, I'm going to use the word unprecedented. Yeah, I mean, everything's unprecedented. We, everything's unprecedented. We've had an unprecedented liquidity injection into the world. Correct. Uh, right after COVID. And so everything that happened afterwards is unprecedented. Correct. So everything you mentioned before from, you know, fake money to uh, meme stocks and all this other stuff. Well, to people entering the market. Like when we look back at this bubble, the thing we'll probably be happiest about is we figured out a scam or a way to get a new generation to suck up the liquidity of the old generation who's going to die and and hand off their portfolios to younger people who didn't have a clue what a, a stock or, or bond was a year and a half ago. We'll, we'll be grateful for, for that. Yeah, that's that's actually a really interesting way to look at it. So it was kind of like a force. The only way lesson. to look at it, where you know, it's a bubble, but like what comes from this bubble is hopefully a next generation of investors to suck up the supply. Yeah, and um, it it's, it sounds like that that lesson had to be learned at some point, and mm -hmm. and maybe COVID was just the the catalyst, um, and and the liquidity injection was the catalyst for for that lesson to happen. Um, but now that that liquidity has has peaked and is going the other way, you're just seeing an unwind of all these of all these trends of of a lot of different things. And you know what's interesting to me is there's obviously been a huge sell off in, in growth stocks um, and momentum stocks. But when you look at the S and P 500, if you look at equities, they're trading four percent within the high. Yeah. Uh, um, and so so what's happening right now is actually not a equity bear market. It's a huge rotation. And it's a huge rotation. Uh, out of what was working, out of into what wasn't working for a long time, which is which is value and international. Um, and if you look at it on the whole, you know, actually, you wouldn't you wouldn't think anything is wrong. Like if you landed from Mars and you looked at some of these broad indices, you'd be like, oh wow, market's trading near a high. Um, but we know that kind of a lot of the stuff that that people bought, that investors bought, that investors chased over the past two years and really bid up has has been. Uh, going the other way for for the past uh, six to nine months now, and, and caused a lot of pain in portfolios. Um, so, you know, I think um, if you look at previous uh, cycles where the Fed starts tightening, there's always been a churn. There's always been kind of a market which has either moved sideways or there's been a lot of rotation. And my view is that this bull market is is nowhere close to to ending. Um, I think we're just kind of starting this this bull market, hmm. but I do think that this um, this digestion or this churn needs to sort itself out, and that's that's what's happening now. I think once the market gets comfortable with with some of these excesses that've been wrung out, I, I think we'll sort of resume the um, the uptrend in growth stocks. Um, and your comment before in terms of Fed hikes being priced in, they they are priced into the bond market. So the bond market now is pricing in four rate hikes for this year. Uh, so if you're bearish because the Fed is going to raise four times, that's already been priced in. That Correct. The market already knows that. So you have to take a view that the Fed is going to raise eight times or 12 times. Uh, and maybe that's the case, but that has to be your view for you to be bearish about Fed rate hikes for the rest of the year. Correct. And this is why it's important to have smart mentors, not just a product like Coifin or Robinhood. You have to have people that have 
seen these things before and understand how markets work. So it's really important at times like this to get out of the, the chat rooms and more into learning. If you want this to be a lifetime thing, which it should be, then the faster you get onto products like Coifin, the better, just so you can just see what other people are seeing. It's very important to see how other people see things. So, so I'm with you on that. The difference is how unprecedented everything was. And, you know, you hear this term, and I want to hear your take on this, the bandied about now, transitory inflation, inflation, blah, 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 energy is working, international is working. It's lovely that these things are working, but they can work for a long time. And we haven't had these rate hikes in an era of weird logistics problems and supply chain problems and COVID and governmental tensions and, you know, the world is no longer shrinking in a sense, the borders are a headache and now you have true inflation. Um, so where does that fit into how you think of the world? Yeah. So, you know, one thing I, I, I think that's important to mention is nobody really understands what inflation is or why it happens. Mm -hmm. Um, I think a lot of people say inflation and, and they'll kind of make these, um, they'll assert things, but if you look at historically, uh, you're talking to one right now. So if I'm asking, <laughs> our, a, a assertion is the most powerful form of. Oh, of I'm uh, captain uh, of the assertive team. <laughs> um, you know, e even if you look at the '70s, like it's not clear why inflation was so high in the '70s and why it wasn't so high. Correct. Uh, in 2009 or 2010, when the Fed started printing money, and you had all these people saying, like, "Aha." Just like in the 30s in Germany, we're about to have inflation, and that never happened. So I wouldn't say it's like totally misunderstood, but I would say people that that you know say this is definitely going to lead to inflation because of X, Y, and Z. There's just no uh, there's no evidence. It's not very consistent in terms of why inflation happens. Um, so to believe in inflation, you have to believe two things. Um, one is that commodity prices are going to keep rising for a long period of time. I mean, like for the next 10 years. And uh, I'm, I'm not sure that's that's the case. I think in the 70s, you had a, a really different dynamic with the, the oil and, and the Middle East situation and some of the embargoes, and that's what caused oil prices to rise. Um, I think there's an argument to be made that oil prices will remain elevated because there's just been so much uh, capex and so much investment that's been taken out of the industry because of ESG and, and other things. So I do think oil prices will remain elevated, but because we have a free market, because higher prices incentivize more companies to eventually drill, um, I think there is a cap on, on commodity prices. So I don't mm -hmm. think we're in this new super cycle where commodity prices are going to be going up for a prolonged period of time because of supply constraints. Um, and, and, and the second thing is you have to believe that there's going to be some kind of demand that's going to keep allowing prices to rise. So, um, you know, we before COVID, we went through this period where the global economy was growing at a very low rate. It was growing below trend for an extended period of time. And people didn't understand why. And maybe there's too much leverage or maybe there's just kind of this shift in population and demographics where you have this big portion of the population that, that stopped working and that's saving and not consuming as much. Um, and I don't think that's changed all that much. I think those headwinds still exist for above trend growth. Um, and so I think you might have average growth over the next 10 years in terms of what the population looks like and what demand looks like. Um, and so for those reasons, because I don't see any sort of outsized demand or growth, I don't see any reason why supply shocks or why commodity prices should, should go higher in a consistent way for the next 10 years. I, I think inflation uh, is the high inflation right now is transitory. It will come back down. So it's not something that I think is going to be one of the key themes that we're talking about a year from now. Um, I actually think that pendulum is going to swing back and we're going to have uh, pretty low single digits inflation a year from now. Yeah, I, I feel that's a great explanation. I feel like the only thing I can count on is that the media will hype everything at the tip. As I warned last year when I was doing our SPAC was that this would be a supply issue. The market was just forcing everybody to go out on the risk spectrum and supply would kill this market, which it has in the tech sector. There were so many IPOs, there were so many SPACs, there were so many private companies, there was just so much capital. And now it's spreading. 
And it's somewhat, as much as it's painful for me, it just reminds me you got to know a little bit more. There's, there's other opportunities that can make money, especially on a relative basis. But in the end, I think what you're saying is the demand ain't there. And while oil should stay elevated, I agree, because it was negative, and we were all having a laugh about that, um, Exxon, for as well as it's done, is still at 2014 prices. For all the cash flow, it's still at 2014 prices. Right. For those people that want a short oil, be careful. But at the same time, you don't see a super cycle. I kind of agree with that. We, you're, not, you're not telling people what to do, but I'm kind of your opinion that the markets are rather healthy here. In fact, this is long overdue, a smack in the face to uh, promoters and charlatans and people that think stocks only go up. And probably good long term to remind people that this is not easy and that they should get. And what's amazing about this cycle is when I grew up with it, we had Yahoo Finance. We thought it was the greatest thing to compare it to what the power of Coifin is ridiculous. And I think people need to spend some time now backing and filling and, and learning these things and finding people like you and Coifin and products on the Internet to do this. One of my biggest issues with fintech is not enough people with experience are starting fintech companies. And I wanted to make sure people got that across is when I talk about Coifin, I'm talking about a team that has lived through markets. It's not built by uh, kids out of Stanford in two years that have one particular view. You know, and, and crypto is much money is flowing in. Think about the fundamentals that still haven't been thought through or created or agreed upon that are going to have to be built. So for all those people, you know, investing in crypto, uh, and most of the people are doing it based on stories and momentum, What's exciting about crypto is if we look 30 years out, what will be the generally accepted fundamentals of these things, if any? I think there will be. And so we're at the very, very earliest, beginningest, uh, if I could assert one thing, is like no one knows crypto yet. Literally no one knows. Because no one knows the stock market and we got all this data in front of us. So where is your thought like on crypto? Yeah, you know, on crypto, I'd say there's there's two extremes, and uh, like anything else, the the truth is somewhere in the middle. So I'd say you know one extreme are the crypto skeptics, um, you know, crypto's worthless and you know it's zero and and um, you know that argument, um, and then the the other uh, side of the argument is like everything's going to be crypto, everything's going to be Web three, everything's going to be on the blockchain, and you know three months ago we were probably closer to to that end of the spectrum. Um, look, I think crypto is here to stay in some form. I think if you were a crypto skeptic 10 years ago, maybe that was kind of like an interesting argument. But because crypto prices and crypto valuation have proven that it's not just a passing fad, there is something there. Um, enough people now agree about the value of, of Bitcoin, uh, whether it should be 40000 or 20000 or I'm not sure. But there's enough people out there that believe it's a currency, and so it's a currency, and that's what yeah. currencies are. They're just a belief that something is, is worth the value, and we're just going to agree on it. Um, and it's not something that can happen every day, right? So it's, it's, I think that has tried to be repeated with, with other uh, cryptocurrencies, and I think you're seeing that, that once you have that supply coming in and more and more things are trying to replicate it, uh, that's going to dilute the initial effect or that initial idea that that asset has value or that currency has value. So... Um, where I see currencies in, in 10 years, I think they'll be around. Um, I think there'll, there'll be certain aspects of blockchain, of blockchain technology that are going to be applicable to the world. Um, I think with kind of trading and clearing, that's the most obvious way or the most obvious application uh, to think about where the benefits would be. Uh, with payments, that's the most obvious application to think about how payments could be seamless and, and have very low transaction costs. Um, I'm a I'm a little bit of a skeptic when it comes to Web three, where I think you know Google and Facebook and all these other companies are going to be displaced, and everything is just going to be owned by everyone on the internet. Um, so I believe that argument that Aaron Levy uh, articulated on Twitter. I sort of um, yeah, I'm going to have him on my podcast. I'm a big fan. Oh, of that's him awesome. Aaron. So so yeah, so he you know he basically says like, look, there's a lot of value that these big companies provide in terms of UI, in terms of distribution. Um, and that's worth something. And that's kind of what, what people forget. And I, and I totally believe that and, and sort of building a, a startup and, and seeing that, um, that resonates with me. So I'm somewhere in the middle. I think there's, you know, crypto is definitely here to stay in some form, one way or another. Um, I don't think it's going to completely displace everything that, that is being done today. 
Uh, but it'll be interesting to see where, where it ends up and, and kind of what the actual applications are going to be. Yeah, here's where I'm at with DAOs, since you asked, even though you didn't. The, uh, it took me forever to live in a gated community, and that's what people do in Phoenix. You do that instead of getting a gun. Uh-huh. Um, Knut, would you agree with that? You're, are you listening? Are you dead? I agree. Okay. So <laughs> it took me forever to go into a gated community. I fucking hate. Now, very nice. No one's tried to evict me out of the community yet. More Ellen than me. But I do not like my neighbors. I think of Dow as an extended version of a gated community where I don't know the people. If I don't know them, for sure I'm not going to like them. And if I do know them, I don't like them. So give me an LLC. I think DAOs are great, but this is like, I'm, this is where I'm a skeptic like you is that like, come on people. And this is why we finally have the swing towards fundamentals. Finally, is that there's nothing wrong with DAOs, but like in a real world view where gated communities are a disaster of people hating on each other. Like I'm trying to get a, a two tennis courts. One of them made a pickleball court, you know, cause no one's played tennis since the forties. And I got two tennis courts in my gated community that I've never seen used except by, you know, people in wheelchairs. Yeah, you know, so I went to the community and I'm like, first of all, I'm trying to find out how to even talk to anybody in the community. And I said, let me get a pickleball court in there. And they're like, no, that would mean that there'd be noise. <laughs> so I'm like, wait a minute. So that's the reason we have tennis courts is because no one uses them. So then I said, why don't we then just have a putting green, which is pretty damn quiet and at least people will use it. So, so that's what I think of when I think of a DAO is like my problems at a gated community times a billion. So be careful people out there. Uh, there's nothing wrong with stonks and, yeah, and stocks. Yeah. Let's, let's just say, I think of something similar, but I think of Animal Farm. Is that a book that I should have read? But I know that's something <laughs> that I'm supposed to Come have read. Come on. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's a book uh, about communism. Yeah, I just think of communism, to be honest. And it's just like, be careful what you wish for. I people think there's... Don't wanna, sorry, people don't want to vote on everything. They just want to... They want some, a lot of time, they just want other people to... I just to want the benefit. Right. I don't want to vote. So be careful what you wish for, people. I think there's some great advice, Rob. I think this is the year of fundamentals, you know, from energy perking its head to international emerging markets perking its head to interest rates. Uh, I agree with you on interest rates. I just refinanced just to make sure that I was doing everything right. I was just shocked at how low rates still are amidst what everybody's panicked about, mm-hmm. uh, rates going up. So um, I think the only thing we can count on is that the media has hyped this to be the end of the world, the 12th end of the world in the last two years. Um, so I appreciate your insights there. Um, I'm excited about Coifin. How do you feel about Coifin? I'm, I'm super excited. All I right, because it's hard. Love- you can't tell. Canute, he's a pretty reserved dude. It's, I tried to get him excited. I don't think I did. <laughs> <laughs> so did, anything I missed before I let you go, Rob? Um no, I'm, uh, how great of an investor am I? I'll, I'll tune out for a sec. Canute, just go with whatever he says here. De- definitely top top ten on our cap table. I uh, know. Uh, no, so the uh, Howard, you were uh, kind of the original institutional investor. So appreciate all your support and you believing in us. And uh, you're definitely one of our best cheerleaders. And, and uh, you um, definitely. So so my question is, how did so as, as a product that gets so much feedback? Last question. Yeah, uh, I only see good feedback. What do people hate about Coifin? Um, I'd say I'd say they hate that we don't have some features that they expect. So one an example is a is a mobile app or a screening tool. Um, I'd say the other thing they hate is that our data outside the U.S. and Canada right now is end of day, and we don't have streaming data for a lot of other markets, which which is kind of like- in You can't roadmap. please everybody. You're focused on what you can focus on, but most of the love is, is amazing. I have it up on my screen every minute. Like I said, what's important about this next stage of FinTech is people that really are passionate about, have decades of experience who are finally forced to come into this world and make the tools better. So I appreciate that. That's kind of what social leverage is looking to do. So it's, it's uh, exciting to be part of this journey. Uh, K-O-Y-F-I-N.com. If people want uh, to reach Rob, just hit me up at the end of the podcast. Uh, Rob, thanks for coming on, and we'll talk to you soon. Thanks, Howard. Thanks, Knut. Thanks for having me on. Thank you, Rob. See ya. K-Nut. Howard. So... 
you know, one of my complaints this year, and I do a lot of complaining because now I have a padded room here to do it and no one hears me. Uh, I've been here a lot when you're not here, Knut, is, I'm trying to pause more for effect, is, is that <laughs> a, there's a lot of newbies. And I love newbies. No one loves newbies more than Howard loves newbies. But I hate them, too, because they make messes. You know, newborns spray ketchup and think it's funny. Uh, they shit their pants. And there's a lot of people shitting their pants and spraying ketchup in the markets the last year. And oh, yeah. it's been all fun and games. And now uh, people are trying to put the ketchup back in the bottle. Uh, people said that puking wasn't funny. Why'd you puke on me? And there's a lot of blame to go around. And I am now trying to be the adult in the room and remind people that, like, this, you can't do it fast. This is what we got. And so you need tools like Koi You need to talk to smart people. You need to talk to people that have been around the bend. They may not know, and they'll still be wrong. I'm wrong all the time. But, like, now's the time to quit joking. You've gotten a warning shot over the bow here in January. The S&P at all-time highs. If you've done damage to your portfolio... It won't be the first time. Hopefully it's the last time, but they're still indexing. There's still a million ways to invest without blowing your brains out and getting stressed every minute of the day. And so, so really kind of take these moments to see what kind of investor you are and want to be and should be. And don't lie to yourself. This is what investing is or moments like this. And be grateful that right now the S&P and the the NASDAQ are basically near all time highs with oil screaming higher and tensions very high. And do you have the stomach for this? Uh, the tools are out there. That's why I wanted to have Koi Fun on right now to talk about this stuff um, you know, for a few bucks a month, if not free, because Koi Fun's mostly free. Uh, you have the tools that, that people wish they had 20 years ago. So there are no excuses. There's just how you plan to think about the market. Is that does that make sense? Can it I, makes a lot of sense. Actually. Yeah. So take care of your own messes. Don't be a sucker and be part of the blame game and the Fed and this promoter and this SPAC and this IPO. It's your money. It's not a joke. It can be, like I say, investing for profit and joy. But there are periods like this where nothing works and you have to rethink everything about what is an investment and what is a strategy. And, and that's just part of the game. So uh, hats off to uh, me for uh, showing up. Uh, I didn't want to. But I did. We're like almost 200 podcasts in. Everyone's really impressed. The, uh, it's really fun to have our own studio. It's, it's so quiet, and I'm enjoying that. And we have our first real offices at Social Leverage and along. We're making lots of hires. And, and really, the market seems finally, Canute, to be coming back to me. You know, COVID was just horrific for everybody. Uh, my little bad case of COVID was I didn't like playing the game in, over Zoom. And and paying the tailwind prices that were going on. Uh, so it was uncomfortable doing nothing for, for most of COVID uh, and seeing two years slip away. But, uh, you know, that's sometimes how long it takes for things to start coming back your way, and you got to be ready for it. So I'm excited about a year of podcasting, and but this is the year of fundamentals. This is the year of talking to smart people and really letting them explain to me mistakes you know, with that smell of panic in the air, whereas the VIX right now is just about 20, but the VIX in the cloud in certain sectors is 80 again. Uh, how do you think about the world in 2022 and beyond? It was good having Jeff Richards on, and uh, we've got Rob at Koi Fence. So we gave, we'll give you the tools. Let's try and uh, make some money and have some fun. Uh, you are listening to Panic with Friends. I'm Howard Lindzen. Search my name, Spotify, Google. Uh, I got a daily blog, but this podcast, if you, if you search it on Apple or Spotify, you'll see my name. You can subscribe. You'll get one every Thursday, an alert, and you can listen whenever you want. Um, thanks, Knut. Thanks, Stocktwits, for distributing. We'll see everybody next week. Howard Lindzen is the founder and general partner at Social Leverage. All opinions expressed by Howard and podcast guests are solely their own opinions and do not reflect the opinion of social leverage or stock twits. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon for decisions. Guests may maintain positions and securities discussed in this podcast. For uh, showing up, uh, I didn't want to, but I did. We're like almost 200 podcasts in. Everyone's really impressed. The, uh, it's really fun to have our own studio. It's, it's so quiet, and I'm enjoying that. And we have our first real offices at Social Leverage and along. We're making lots of hires. And, and really, the market seems finally, Canute, to be coming back to me. 
you know, COVID was just horrific for everybody. Uh, my little bad case of COVID was I didn't like playing the game in, over Zoom and and paying the tailwind prices that were going on. Uh, so it was uncomfortable doing nothing for, for most of COVID uh, and seeing two years slip away. But, uh, you know, that's sometimes how long it takes for things to start coming back your way, and you got to be ready for it. So I'm excited about a year of podcasting, and but this is the year of fundamentals. This is the year of talking to smart people and really letting them explain to me mistakes. You know, with that smell of panic in the air, whereas the VIX right now is just about 20, but the VIX in the cloud in certain sectors is 80 again. Uh, how do you think about the world in 2022 and beyond? It was good having Jeff Richards on, and uh, we got Rob at Koi Fence. So we gave, we'll give you the tools. Let's try and uh, make some money and have some fun. Uh, you are listening to Panic with Friends. I'm Howard Lindzen. Search my name, Spotify, Google. Uh, I got a daily blog, but this podcast, if you if you search it on Apple or Spotify, you'll see my name. You can subscribe. You'll get one every Thursday, an alert, and you can listen whenever you want. Um, thanks, Knut. Thanks, Stocktwits, for distributing. We'll see everybody next week. Howard Lindzen is the founder and general partner at Social Leverage. All opinions expressed by Howard and podcast guests are solely their own opinions and do not reflect the opinion of Social Leverage or StockTwits. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon for decisions. Guests may maintain positions and securities discussed in this podcast. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon for decisions. Guests may maintain positions and securities discussed in this podcast.